After getting some interesting political insights to metropolitan governance, our next section, session will now focus on the way forward on some important issues like metropolitan economy, transport mobility, and restructuring the metro relationship with municipal and non-municipal territorial entities along with state and central governments. Sri Arun Mishra, the Secretary, Ministry of Housing Government of India will chair this session. On our panel of discussants, we have an interesting mix of government officials and ex-officials. We have Ms. Uma, Chief Planner, MMRDA, Ms. N. Usha, Senior, uh, senior Planner, CMDA, Mr. Sista Vishwanath, former Director of Planning, HMDA, Sri A. Ravindra, Urban Advisor to the CM of Karnataka. To get the industry perspective, we are joined by Mr. V. Suresh, who in addition to being the former CMD Hutko, is also the Principal Executive Officer, Hirko Developers. Joining him is Mr. Nasir Munji, Chairman, DCB Bank. Mr. Munji is also on the governing board of CPR. Professor N. Sridharan, who is the head of department and professor of planning, SPA Delhi, would provide the academic inputs to this session. I now request the chair to take over. Thank you very much. Uh, as expected, the second day afternoon lunch session, it's rather difficult to keep your interest, but I will sincerely request you to try to hold it as long as you can. Uh, incidentally, we have a group of people here who are actually grappling with the issues that have been raised. We have been debating for the last two days. Uh, how do you govern a metropolitan area? Is it actually necessary? Is it governable? And if so, what, what is the best way of doing it? So we'll hear these uh, um, extremely esteemed panel members because from their experience, they will say what needs to be done. But before that, I'll start with from the last question that was raised before lunch. Uh, one uh, very in interesting intervention was that uh, a question was posed to the uh, minister. Uh, what is their take on having a political body at the metropolitan level? Basically what the idea was, uh, today in our system, we have uh, clearly three defined systems of political existence. One, of course, at the national level, the second one at the state level, and third one at the local bodies level. When you say local bodies level, you mean both the urban local bodies and the rural local bodies. But there is no concept of a fourth system. There is no concept of a fourth body, whether we call it a metropolitan region or any other region. There is no concept of a political existence at the regional level. When there is no system of political existence at the regional level, when you talk about governance at the regional level, and governance at that kind of a level which is slightly below the state and slightly above the local body, urban local body, as defined in our constitution, then it becomes a totally different ball game altogether. So it's a very important issue. And uh, it's definitely true that this has been brought into focus after the constitutional amendments. The 73rd and 74th Amendment, of course, made this happen, made this a constitutional reality. But what also the 73rd and 74th Amendment made sure is political empowerment of the third tier of government. Before that, we had a political empowerment at the national level, at the state level. The members of the parliament and the members of the legislative assembly. These two constituted the political power. They were the repositories of political power. These amendments made sure that in the local bodies, whether it is the urban local bodies or it is the rural local bodies, a political leadership grew up. The elections were made compulsory, mandatory. Even a state like Jharkhand and even a state like Jammu and Kashmir had to go through a process of elections, even though it took a little while. But now, in the rest of the country, the third tier of democracy, which is the political leadership, at the local level, which is at the urban local body level and the panchayat level, well entrenched, very strong. So it's not a question of it's MP versus MLA anymore. It's a question of MP versus MLA versus corporator versus MP. So then typically what we have seen is that one of the things that we try to do is when you get power, we try to preserve it, we try to protect it. We do not allow other people to come in. 
in such a situation whether it is a whether it is the devolution of power from the national level to the state level or from the state level to the local level is still work in progress it's still a struggle it's not a smooth transition at all and you should not expect it to be a smooth transition in such a situation to be to think that all these three people who have gained power and who are struggling to retain power in their hands will be able to abdicate a part of that power and create a fourth level of governance at the regional level is not an easy task so that is something that we have been grappling on it's so one point is very clear that despite the constitutional amendments the metropolitan governing council as was envisaged has not come into place the second important point which most of the speakers have missed out even though there has been a lot of talk about local public participation local participation the other thing that was mandated in the constitutional amendment was the establishment of area sabhas no one spoke about the area sabhas so that also is a symptomatic while we don't want to abdicate our power to someone superior to us we are also in no position to give our power to someone below us no corporator say like the area sabhas to be constituted so that the area sabhas voice will be heard like no sarpanch will like the gaon sabha to be convened so that the gaon sabha's voice to be heard so that's a struggle so in such a situation while we agree that a regional planning is absolutely necessary some kind of a coordinated effort is absolutely necessary it's also a fact that we have to accept the realities the struggle of political power versus financial power also as a reality and come out think of a solution two things are very clear some of the questions that have been raised in the morning everyone knows that the number of urban areas in the country has almost doubled today we have about 8000 census urban areas and when you had urban agglomerations which used to be 384 has now gone up to 475 that's a 25% increase 30 there were 1 million plus cities but 35 now it has gone up to 53 that's a 50% increase so while the number of urban areas uh, urban agglomerations has increased by 25% the number of urban agglomerations with a population of 1 million plus has already gone up to 53 if you drill it down and bring it to 100000 towns with 100000 population is approximately about 490 plus more like 500 1000 500 towns so it's a fact india with a large population will have to take care of this and most of the people say that in the next 10, 10 years the urban population in the country will go up from 31% to at least 40% if not 50% 50% in india is very difficult to achieve because our base is very very large but even with 40% people living in the urban areas which is already struggling for water supply for electricity for uh, waste disposal for sanitation everything is a huge task so all the planners here agree to the fact that this is a natural phenomena the municipalities have grown the peri urban areas have grown a coordinated effort is required whether it can be done through a constitutional amendment whether it can be done done by giving a proper power to a body which is an independent body of all these three or you can think of a way in which maybe some of the activities like planning activities can be given to one body and the next 4 to 5 years you use this period to advocate to sensitize and to make people aware that while individual interests are being met look regional interests will also have to be seen can is it possible that we create some kind of a interim period in which there is no conflict between the existing political power base and the emerging political power base existing organization structure and the proposed organization is it possible these are some of the issues that still need answers and personally i feel that a little amendment here and there will make some difference but will not make a material difference major difference but before we come to the final conclusion we would like to hear the panelists here who have tremendous experience so if you allow me i will start with requesting nasir ji will you be ready okay. yeah well i'm the newest addition to this panel uh, no you sorry. choose you can choose your panel uh, whatever yeah please i request mr she needs no introduction anyway um so i was just over lunch jotting out what came the top of my head listening to the arguments that were made this morning 
And I just want to move away a little bit from the regional metropolitan issues. I think we've heard of those. Uh, but get down to some basics and try to think, as we're looking forward, what is the nature of the institutions we're going to require as we move down the road? Um, I'm a great believer in objectives. India believes in processes, processes and existing institutions. If I were to ask the question about objectives, what is the objective of Bombay over the next 10 years or five years? The objectives, what do we want to be? I don't think we'd get an answer. Uh, look at our small towns, look at even our medium-sized town. What are the objectives that we have? Now, institutions are derived from objectives. What do you want to achieve? And will our existing institutions help us achieve those objectives, or will they not? And if they will not, then we have to redefine those institutions according to what the objectives are. I was in Malaysia recently, and the whole area of Johor, for example, the Iskandar development, is, has a clear objective to beat Singapore, which is right across the river. So they've set up a whole institutional form that is going to do that, which is going to require $30 billion worth of expenditure and investment. And there's a whole technique of how that's being done. And they've changed the institutional structure. They're not using the old ones. There's a completely new one that's been invented to make sure that Johor happens. Now, I think in India, we have to change the nature of the debate and really ask, where are we heading? Where are we going? So that's my first point. I have about six points, so I'll, I'll finish in five minutes. The other is basic infrastructure and planning. I mean, you know, in India, Bombay, for example, needs eight complete sewerage treatment plants. How many do we have? Not a single one. Whose problem is that? Whose responsibility is that? Whose accountability is that? We, India does not have a single sanitary engineered landfill site. There may be half a dozen coming up now. But up to now, we've had not a single sanitary engineered landfill site. So all I'm saying is basics are not in place. The basics for development. And I think that's where we need to look at. The aesthetics of the urban form. You look at any of your small towns today, whether it's in Kesho, in Gujarat, or Bareilly, or Haldwani, or you go to, you drive through any, or Ludhiana, you go to any town. The aesthetics of the urban form is something disastrous. Are these going to be the visions of our new society? Is this the new society we're trying to build where millions of people are going to live? Answer is no. Why is this aesthetics wrong? Who's going to talk about it? Who's going to deal with it? Which, are, which of our institutions are going to look at it? So that's, that's the problem set. And I do think we need to think in bite sizes. We can't change institutions overnight. They have to evolve. There's a whole evolution that needs to take place. Uh, and in a sense, I'm a great believer in critical spaces. We don't even think in terms of critical spaces within our cities. You can't change cities. You cannot change regions. But you could think of critical spaces. The midlands, for example, in Bombay is a critical space. It links the north to the south, east to the west. Nobody ever thought about it as a critical space when they opened up development. Uh, it's a, you know, uh, Johor is a critical space. We as a nation will have to think through, our objectives will have to be, what are these critical spaces? And which are the institutions that will address those issues? The Delhi-Bombay corridor is coming up, and this is perhaps one example of a critical uh, a corridor, let's say, it's not a critical space. But at least I think some beginnings of our thinking is going on as to how we might think about those things. I think in terms of institutions, you have governmental institutions, which we've been talking about. We have civil society institutions, and we have partnerships between the two. Unfortunately, partnerships don't exist. It's a very, very rare thing. Even PPP, I think you talked about PPP yesterday, but, and I was instrumental in starting that whole PPP in infrastructure. As I look back 10 years, the last P never existed. There was no partnership. It was public-private contracting. And each one took a view as to how that uh, was going to work. The last P was ignored. And I think we have to bring the last P back into the equation. How do we partner each other to build what, uh, the future of India, which is what urban, uh, the urban spaces are going to be? And how do we work with government institutions, civil society institutions, 
and how do we create partnerships between the two? So I think the answer lies in the, as we look forward in how we do that. Uh, Narendra sitting here and uh, Bombay First, I see, has uh, been part of this whole process. But Bombay First is an example of a civil civic society institution, which is addressing issues of the city, uh, or at least trying to bring people back into the debate. Um, now, what is this new generation of public-private institution? And I think the Marco spoke so eloquently this uh, this morning, uh, and I thought he had something very interesting to say. Um, in terms of the demand and supply side in the political equation. Um, but how do we actually bring that about? And I think you can only bring that about through a new generation of public-private institution. And what is this new public-private institution where stakeholders are involved, the government is involved, and the government has to be a key player. It cannot be a peripheral player. It also suggests that we have to build very strong public institutions. And, and our public institutions fail us. And as long as the public institutions fail us, public-private partnerships will never work unless we have strong public institutions with clear objectives. HUTCO is one such, and uh, Suresh was the CMD. But I was distressed to find that HUTCO does a lot of power financing, and the urban and housing agenda sort of disappeared. So you suddenly ask, what is the objective? And in, in fact, the huge objective, if you have a strong public institution, we could turn HUTCO around to address lots of other issues which would partner a lot of private investment. There's a whole range of things HUTCO could do. It already exists. So I think one area is to transform existing institutions. You don't have to get rid of them. Transform them to play a role in the objectives that we have uh, as we move, move. India has IIFSL, which is the India Infrastructure financial company, again, that could be a very strong inf institution for infrastructure investments. But I'm also thinking of a new generation institution, which I'm trying to do in Goa, for example, a small state. And if you take a small state and create an institutional form, it can actually start helping to transform the larger states. It's a much more complex. In Goa, I'm trying to build something called the Goa Partnerships, which government will have 26% and others will have the balance. And basically what Goa Partnerships will do is create an intellectual talent that will allow us to plan the policy framework, the infrastructure uh, development plan for both our cities as well as our network infrastructure, and have a component of the political economy of change, actually addressing and going down to the constituencies, working with those constituencies, and getting a joint participation in that whole process. Uh, it'll transcend governments because governments come and go, but Goa partnerships will be there to ensure that the whole process of investment does take place. It will also do the transaction, the contractual structures, the complex investment strategies that are required for investments to actually happen. So in a sense, this we need to build at the state level. If you ask, my, if you ask today, who is at the state level? Where is that intellectual capacity? Do people think about it? How can it actually happen? And the answer is no, it doesn't exist. And if there are good people, they leave. So I think we, we do have a real problem. Uh, Shirish Patel, I don't know whether he was here earlier, um, but he was instrumental in setting up, and I'm very much part of it, the, the, uh, India, uh, the Indian Human Settlements Institute, Institute for Human Settlements, IIHS which is to build a new generation of urban practice degrees, where you build the new urban professional, the new planners, a whole new breed of people who will think through the sorts of problems we are facing. So there's a whole human resource development. Um, so let me leave those thoughts with you in the sense that as we look forward, we have an agenda to transform existing institutions, to deliver, to actually work uh, to deliver uh, uh, what they ought to be delivering, um, creating a new series of institutions which will address those issues and those gaps that exist today to, to cement public-private partnerships, uh, emphasis on partnerships. Um, I'm strongly in favor of elected mayors. We've, we've talked about that, who are, who, are, who are empowered and become CEOs of the city. I think every part of the globe has has, mayor, has democratic traditions in their cities. Uh, I live in a village in Goa, and I have 
very strong democratic uh, levels at the panchayat. Because when we go to the Gram Sabha meetings, everything that happens in our village is there. It's discussed, and individuals are part of it, and everybody has a say. Um, so you're seeing this at the at that level, but you're not seeing this at the city level. Uh, and why can't we have more democratic institutions as far as our cities are con concerned? So I think these are some of these issues, uh, and I think we need to be getting our hands around them and looking at how governance, institutional reform, transformation would have to happen. And a lot of this probably has to be driven bottom up because the, those in charge today have no incentive to change the structure at all. So it has to really happen when there's a groundswell that is putting <coughs> positive uh, suggestions, positive models on the table, which we can do. So let me just leave you with a two, two small examples. As a citizen of India, I took an interest in Hazrat Ganj in Lucknow, which was a dilapidated, de deteriorating street of the most beautiful city we have. It was just an individual effort. I put five years into it. We got a portfolio done. I never saw, thought I'd ever see any change at all. But when we gave the portfolio to Mayawati, uh, she looked at the portfolio and she said, I want this done in two months. And actually didn't. And Hazrat Ganj was transformed to, a, to an extent which even the World Bank president <laughs> commented that UP is on a different plane now by transforming one street. That one street led to different precincts in Lucknow saying they would like the same thing. The Lucknow Municipal Corporation woke up and said, we're going to help support it. So they got very energetic. The Kanpur people came to Lucknow to see what's happening and said, we would like to do it. All I want to say is small, bite-sized transformations can actually set a multiplier effect, which bottom up starts to start changing things. Now, if I went to the Lucknow minister, the, the municipal commissioner and said, you do something about Hazrat Gandhi, nothing would have happened you need to put in the positive effort and the positive effect gets addressed. So that's a real hope in India that things do happen if you actually have the patience to do things on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Munji introduced a very new concept and I think it, the solution some, somewhere lies around that particular concept. It's a concept of a partnership as opposed to a body which is formally constituted uh, that is something which we really need to seriously think about it. I can give you a couple of examples just to supplement what you have to say. About 25 years ago, when I was doing a course in Washington, D.C., I went to an office which was basically involved in designing a metro railway system for the Washington, D.C. metro area, which also had other than Washington, D.C., places like Arlington, places like uh, Baltimore, places like, uh, you know, their neighboring Maryland areas. And I was surprised because I was a bureaucrat. And I expected a government office to be there with lots of staff, people running around, schemes and other things. This was a civil society organization whose primary task was to bring all the state governments together, try to tell them what is good for them, all the municipalities together. So that kind of a partnership that they developed. It, to a certain extent, a similar example I also found when I went to Miami Metropolitan Development Area. 13 municipalities all agreeing to come together, find a partnership, find a solution for the drainage system of Miami area, find a solution for the sewerage system of the Miami area. So that is something which is very important and which is, I think, doable without creating an immediate animosity against the established bodies. So that is something which is very, which is a very good take that will take from your uh, intervention. Hazrat Ganj example is also very good. The only flaw in Hazrat Ganj example is that normally in a democratic system, we like the municipality to take the lead. Here it was, he knows it better. It was not the municipality which took the lead. It was a totally different body, which is while it is good for the place, is not good for the municipality. So it, it's a wonderful example. We are extremely proud of that. Thank you very much, because I come from UP Carter. Okay. So thank you very much for that. So since he had mentioned Hardco, not for any other reason, I will just ask Mr. Suresh, who had been the former CMD of Hardco, to be the next speaker. Thank you so much, sir.
I think I'll take off the first point from where uh, um, it has been uh, left or Nazar has left. Well, I left the organization about 10 years back, but as long as the term I was there, it was just doing the job or the objective for which it has been done, namely to do housing, both for the urban and the rural areas, and urban development in a large way to cover all the infrastructure that's required at the utility level, water supply, sewerage, waste management, transportation, and all related ones, social infrastructure for health, education, and recreation, and commercial infrastructure for office and commercial complex and all. Uh, maybe sometime down the line, maybe after in the last few years' time, infrastructure projects from cities may not have been coming. I'm only making a guess, even though I have no um, access to what must have happened, is that funds for infrastructure, 50-50% for housing, 50% for infrastructure must be there. But hardcore city infrastructure project may not have been coming. Partly could be some funding coming under the JNNURM. And therefore, utilizing that fund for power infrastructure could be one way of doing it. But I'm sure at some point of time, they'll come back into their main job for which the organization set up. That's a clarification, I they, thought. I think they have. Uh, yeah, they have. I'm glad I, that's a, that answers that. But having been in this sector for the last 48 years, uh, I have a few observations to make. And since the metropolitan region context that we are discussing, um, we are going in for a major, major explosion, which already happened in the sense that just around 28 crores by 2001, we already crossed an additional 10 more crores added in about 10 years' time period. Out of the 20 crores additional added from 2001 to 2011, more than 50% have shifted to urban areas. I was in Ahmedabad uh, last week there. More than 70% of the increase in population are all in the urban areas as far as Gujarat is concerned. Very interesting development. I mean, all, whether it's Vadodara or Rajkot or Surat or Ahmedabad, that's the way things are going on. What the message I'm trying to put across is that from 28 crores of population in 2001, by 2020, we are just about another about seven or eight years now, we would be already crossing around 50, 54 crores of urban population. We are going to the doubling the urban population in and predominantly in the metropolitan region and maybe the metro cities, which was mentioned by Mishraji, going to 53, that might go to about 70 or uh, that by the time. All these are occupying, contributing over 70% of the GDP, but all these are occupying just 3% is the urban land footprint in the whole country's area. 97% is all rural agriculture. So the first major action that we have to do to resolve the problems of this new population coming of the order of roughly, as I said, around 40 odd uh, crores uh, population coming in these particular cities from 28 crores to 56 crores over there is by putting at least about 3% to 6% of India's landmass has got to be planned on. So the planning of the new assembly of landmass is an important component. And how do you increase that? Either vertically increase densification or horizontally going to new areas where it does not happen. This metropolitanization and the greater regional growth, the way you are seeing in Mumbai, the way you are seeing in Bangalore, in Chennai, in the NCR region, as well as in Calcutta, which each one of them has become from metropolitan development authority to metropolitan regional development authority. It is no more, uh, it is no more an MMDA or it was it is an MMRDA. Bangalore is the regional development authority. So you're going to get into municipal corporation, municipalities like Mishraji mentioned uh, the uh, areas where they are working with so many municipalities and many panchayats. So your characters of your municipal corporations, now for example, take, take the case of Mumbai itself, which was mentioned here. In, in addition to the municipal corporation, Greater Mumbai, your Thane, your Kalyan, Dombivili, you have the new town development, what you thought was new. You'll be surprised to know the Navi Mumbai, which is just about 30 to 40 years creation, it's already been a 20 lakhs plus, it's a 2 million plus, it's a municipal corporation already. So therefore you're going to deal municipal corporations itself at one level, municipalities at another level, as well as many panchayas also there. So one major issue, since I have a great planner sitting on my left side, and another great planner sitting on my right side, both being ladies, and of course Sridharan staff to lead at there, is the most important, what is going to be the spatial planning of that? 
even though under the 74th amendment each municipal corporation has to do by and large the directorate of town and country planning was doing it at many cities or otherwise in many big cities the metropolitan planning and the master planning is done by the development authority whether the chennai metropolitan development authority or the bangalore Metro uh, development authority or uh, for that matter here the mumbai Me metropolitan regional development authority so the planning function the spatial planning function has been to a large extent looked after by this development authority which cuts across the regional growth cutting across many municipalities and cities and there, once you put that particular spatial planning requirement, you also are able to put the facilities for the infrastructure, whether the water line or the sewer line or the road transport or the power line or the telecom line, etc., which have got to find the right place. For example, one good initiative Delhi has done is when the Dwarka plan was there, clear corridor was there for the metro planning over there, which is the mass rapid transport planning was part of the particular issue. So therefore, or one of the important points that I just sort of indicate is, in addition to the role of the municipal corporations or municipalities or panchayats within the metropolitan region, they may do at the local level function, the larger level of the planning, including development at the infrastructure level. Most of the good infrastructure development are initiated with the MMRDA and not by the municipal corporation of Greater Mumbai, which has got the biggest budget than many, many number of states itself is involved. So therefore, and the last one is the regulatory function. How, do, how are you going to regulate the building development function? Would that be with the municipal corporation or at the level, or maybe the building permit can come at that level, but the overall development permit can come from the development authority. So it's a larger issue that comes from that particular point of view. Equally important is the third tier. You said about four tiers. One of the important areas where cities are being run, while the municipal corporation, municipalities can take care of many functions, Mumbai is an exception, so let's not take that. In all of the cases, the water supply and sewerage line are either done by the PHED, or by the city level water supply and sewerage board. You have the Bangalore water supply board, Chennai water board, Hyderabad water board, Delhi Jalnigam. These are only city level water boards. Otherwise, the state level water boards are there, or UP Jalnigam for that matter, for the whole state is there. Here you have the Maharashtra Jeevan Pradhikaran to come. But here is the only city which has a hydraulic engineer. Uh, where the water supply and sewerage scheme can be handled over there. So what I'm trying to do, water supply and sewerage is another major related work, which particular thing as parastatals I call them, for one is that power is the electricity board, public or the private sector, electrical one, telecom again can come not only from the uh, public sector provider, now a large number of the private sector providers are come in this particular area. And the last one is the most important is the transportation component. Whether it is going to be on the bus transport travel or it is going to be on the rail transport travel or the mass rapid transport or the private vehicle, the concept of the uh, unified metropolitan transport authority has already started coming in many cities now. It's a very good concept where all transportation modes are unified, regulated by an AMTA, which will be a unified metropolitan transport authority, which can deal with the uh, even including the possibility of ticket sharing between the bus as well as the rail as well as the mass rapid. So therefore, how do you position the role of UMT in the overall metropolitan regional context is also, even though they deal with one particular thing of transportation and the movement of people and goods from the work area to the living area to recreation area, very important. A city's efficiency to a large extent will depend upon how good a transport planning they have done. And so transportation to lead urban development, not follow urban development is a larger message that comes over there. And this particular positioning has got to be done in a very large way. And equally important, uh, like, like water board, sewer board, electricity board, transport authorities, public and private related one, how do you work with that? And that should be, that vision of transport planning should also be with the overall metropolitan regional development as MMRD is now doing of providing all the flyovers and super flyovers, including the monorail or this rail, et cetera, even though various departments are dealing with that. Another dimension that has been very well brought on, which I also have, is of course partnership has got to come in over there. And I, I would only like to add to the PPP word that he has said, largely the PPPP, adding the one more P is the people, namely public, private people's partnership and not public-private partnership because already any city development worth its name, if it's a, the community and the residents and the society or the industries are participating, in addition to private sector, uh, what can I say, infrastructure development agency for waste management or a road project or rail project, the community comes in a very large way. 
rightly brought out, Mumbai First is a good example. Bangalore Agenda Task Force is a good example. Bagir, Bagidari in uh, Delhi is a good example. Better Cochin Resource Center is an excellent one, where the people themselves are participating in the shape of things. I was in uh, Indore recently over there. I'd be very happy to know one of the master plans prepared by the people themselves. They had not waited for the Indore Development Authority or the Town Planning Department of Madhya Pradesh. People themselves joined, the architects and planners and practitioners joined together and prepared. This is the master plan vision that we have for the city. Amazing. I had never heard of such an initiative coming. And what is good is the Town Planning Department, it's also regional development is happening. It's the fastest growing city. You should see the amount of power in the development of Indore there. So therefore, what I'm trying to do is bring in more and more of the PPPP component, and there should be space for that. The, the, the state government and the local government or the development authorities should be able to give the right space for these type of institutions where the civil society themselves are participating in this particular activity. Like the Nasser's excellent example that he has already indicated, I'm aware of the Mumbai First initiatives also into a very large way. So that's the one more di dimension onto this we'll have to provide. This will have some changes and tweaking with respect to the present provisions of the 74th Amendment where everything has to be done at the level of the municipal corporation. That's the way it is. And this is where I want to tell the last point of mine. Do we have the capacity and the capability within the municipal corporation? Excepting maybe I can count it by the two, the fingers of the two hands. Ten I'm putting out of maybe around 127 municipal corporations that we have in the country and uh, uh, the various other where mayors are there, where you have good, capable plan. Very rarely you have a, a physical planner or a spatial planner or a town planner in most of the municipal corporations. Never. It's never there. And we have never been having, as you rightly said, never been having a sanitary uh, engineer in respect of the waste management. Waste management is going to be one of the biggest problems facing all our cities. Uh, ranging for 200 tons to as much as 7,000 tons per day is the type of, to deal with such type of handling over there, you have the wherewithal within the local body to deal with that. It cannot just be a health officer or somebody to deal with, et cetera. So what I'm trying, a larger message is that we got to give what is called the new metropolitan city managers. So it is managing the city every day. How do you control, how do you run your cities from morning till night? Do you have the capability either in respect of the technocrats or the engineering team or the water or the wastewater or the power or the road? And of course, the one to deal or managing the whole thing. It's a high specialization area. Uh, I'm happy Nazar is taking the lead for the institution to deal with that training. HSMI is also doing some work, Human Settlement Management Institute. But this is an area we got to find out a new breed. I would end with that particular thing for a major effort for strengthening the capacity building and capability with the right level of city managers to deal with the type of uh, urbanization which is actually an exploding situation. Thank you. Thank you. The point that Mr. Suresh raised is very relevant. Capacity building absolutely goes without saying is of primary importance. Under the government programs, of course, under the JNERM, each state and each municipality is provided with a technical cell, which they want to appoint, but the number of whether you get the right kind of people for those jobs or not is a different thing. The other important point Mr. Suresh raised is the rise of the parastator. The constitutional amendment very clearly stipulates that systems like water supply, sewerage, and even transport as well should basically lie with the municipalities. But in many cases, even after the constitutional amendment, these parastatals have become more and more important, more and more relevant, primarily because of two reasons. One, of course, is the municipalities do not have the capacity or the finances to deal with such major issues like water supply systems or sewerage systems. And number two issue is that in many cases, the sourcing of these resources, of water or the disposal of these things like the wastage, go beyond the municipal level. So there is a need for a regional planning and regional body. Whether that's absolutely necessary or not, there are some municipalities which are large in number, which are large in area and capacity, they can handle it themselves. But a large majority of them still depend on the parastatals. But we have two excellent officers who have actually handled this now. I will request both of them to speak. Uh, um, since we have about five to six speakers, my request will be that if you can confine yourself within 10 minutes, it shall be a great help. So can I request Ms. Uh, Umar to start? She is, looks after the MMRDA region, chief planner of MMRDA. Everyone knows what MMRDA, at least who are those who are in Bombay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, 
what I metropolitan areas uh, consist of uh, multiple administrative jurisdictions, and at times they overlap, at times they form parts of uh, these jurisdictions. For example, uh, Mumbai metropolitan region consists of two full districts and two half districts. So we know that economic growth data, then entire census data related to households and uh, uh, demographic data, and uh, data related to employment that comes through economic census that happens once in five years in Maharashtra, all this data comes in the form of district level data. So it becomes very difficult to correlate this information and compile at the level of a metropolitan region uh, to understand what are the trends that are observed in the last uh, decade or uh, half decade. So, and to be able to do this, uh, one of the suggestions that came out was to redistrictize the uh, immediate surrounding area so that metropolitan region whose jurisdiction doesn't change that often as compared to some other uh, jurisdictions such as municipalities. Uh, so this, this area can form full districts, one or two or three or four, whatever, but not part of districts. This, this was one suggestion uh, to manage data organization. Second is, Second is, so this will also ensure that there are no multiple jurisdictions of democratic institutions today. Uh, to give an example, we have an MPC in Mumbai metropolitan region, which sits on two full districts and two part districts. The, full, the two full districts have their own district planning committees under the same constitutional amendment. And the two part districts have their own district planning committees, DPCs, and uh, who have their own independent uh, role to play. And MPC tries to sit over two half and two full, and then there is a um, friction arising out of this. And secondly, there are um, Zilla Parishads and district collectorates existing within the system. And they, there are certain role distributions between uh, an ideal MPC and an ideal Zilla Parishad and uh, district collectorates uh, in terms of developmental functions uh, and then uh, fund delegation kind of functions. So they often overlap and lead to some kind of friction. Uh, so th there needs to be some kind of uh, organization of spatial structure, at the same time functional structures that are uh, mandated under the constitution today. Secondly, we also have uh, uh, a thousand villages in Mumbai metropolitan region. And these thousand villages are um, ranging between very small village of 100 people to something like 5,000 people. So uh, if we are wanting a planned transformation of urbanization in this region, on areas that can be urbanized and that need not be conserved, then, then this, uh, this has to happen in a very systematic manner. And to address 1,000 uh, I mean, village panchayats and to convince them to come to this transformation stage and to prepare a spatial organization uh, for this planned urbanization is going to be easier if there is some kind of restructuring of these 1,000 villages into probably 100 Nagar panchayats uh, in the areas especially where they are going to be urbanized. Uh, as per the uh, uh, whatever analysis that happens at the regional level. So there could be some uh, restructuring at this stage. And uh, also there is a division of uh, uh, developmental functions and the financial structures between Zilla Parishads and uh, any new DPC or MPC structure that is going to be there. Because Zilla Parishads today channelize all the developmental funds that come through state and center and any other channel. Uh, so the political economy at that level might not be willing to divest their uh, uh, authority over uh, uh, these devolved funds. So in a, uh, the transformation of MPC into a, also a political entity and a financial entity should happen in such a manner that during a transition period there must be some guarantees and entitlements uh, of continuation to the existing systems and um, subsequently phase out institutions like Zilla Parishad in these areas and transfer those functions to the Metropolitan Planning Committees. And lastly, um, uh, uh, there was a lot of discourse since yesterday on uh, the governance structures at this level. Uh, when we checked up with some legal experts, I am told that uh, MPC need not be ruled out as uh, an alternative to panchayat or municipal structure. It can be termed as the third tier under the constitution. It doesn't have to be a fourth tier. I do not know exactly what that means in terms of elimination of existing uh, municipal and um, village structures. Uh, however, it appears to be, uh, if uh, uh, everybody willing, it appears to be a possible structure as governance structure. But no matter what form of governance structure it takes, uh, in its current form, I think what would be at least expected would be to marry the existing uh, regional development authorities or metropolitan development authorities with the MPC as their boards. 
That's the least I think uh, one should be doing. I am not sure whether I am really representing MMRD or the government of Maharashtra while saying this. <laughs> but I think that is the least uh, uh, one should be doing in the short term. Uh, replace the boards of our authorities of these institutions with the elected body of MPC. And if the number of elected members within the MPC today appears very large, some amendments to that extent can happen that these boards can function more uh, uh, frequently and uh, with, with slightly lesser numbers of elected people. Um, so these are three or four suggestions I have. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I request you? She's from Calcutta. No, no. Chennai. Chennai, Chennai. Chennai, 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 Chennai Development Authority. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I first thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak on this August gathering. I, I am a senior planner with Chennai Metropolitan Development Authority. Uh, most of the points which I wanted to cover were already covered by Mr. Uh, Suresh. Uh, Chennai Metropolitan area extends as of now over 1,189 square kilometers and apart from Chennai Corporation, uh, there are a few municipalities and what we call as town panchayats and uh, uh, local villages, panchayat villages. Uh, CMDA has now sent a proposal to the government to extend uh, the jurisdiction. We have given two suggestions, one to about 4,000 square kilometers and the next for about 8,000 square kilometers, 8,800 square kilometers. The concept behind this is we are also feeling the need for uh, establishing a regional development authority like what Mumbai has done, Hyderabad has done. Uh, Delhi, of course, they were pioneers in the NCR. Uh, planning board and uh, in fact we thought uh, we were the last ones to come up with this suggestion. The orders of the government is awaited. And uh, Chennai traditionally we have, um, uh, it's, a, it's a semicircle, you must have seen the plans here. The metropolitan area is semicircle in nature with arterial roads uh, branching off in the north and in the center and in the south. So we have the uh, manufacturing uh, corridor in the western side. We have. Uh, all major, uh, um, like Hyundai uh, um, and other uh, Nokia and other industries in the Western Corridor. And of course, we have the famous IT Corridor in the south, which is along the beach Bay of Bengal. And a uh, lot of impetus were given for IT industries. The government came up, came up with a lot of incentives for promoting IT Corridor. And in fact, CMDA has been recently interested with the task of preparing a development plan for this uh, uh, MM Nagar, Marimali Nagar, Tirupuru, IT corridor. In fact, the, the current area is actually beyond the jurisdiction of CMDA, but government has given it, uh, uh, given us as a special task. And uh, that could be because uh, we look at it in a holistic manner and we give a spatial plan, which what uh, Mr. Suresh was suggesting. And coming back to the um, conference objective on the mega city governance, uh, we personally feel that uh, the, in the plethora of institutions involved, the, multi, the Metropolitan Planning Committee is obviously the only choice for us for metropolitan level uh, governance. Uh, there is no question on that. And um, uh, if, uh, okay, the delineation of the metro region, now we have given proposals. So the Metropolitan Planning Committee can be linked to this uh, metro region, whatever we are going to delineate. The composition and other things, of course, uh, it needs to change a little bit, as uh, my colleague from MMRDA pointed out. Uh, the elected representatives and uh, the technocrats, uh, that mix can be uh, uh, decided on an appropriate basis. But what, as a planner, what we find is we prepare very good plans, but when it comes to implementation, the problem is the stakeholding agencies do not uh, projectize their proposals based on what is suggested in the plan. And that is the reason why haphazard developments uh, take place. So the Metropolitan Planning Committee's functions can be in such a way that it ensures that uh, all these line agencies' proposals are implemented in line with what is suggested in the planning document. In that way, we will be able to achieve what we really want to. So uh, that uh, that will be the um, most uh, important function of this uh, committee as and when it is constituted. And we can really see and uh, you know, we can translate these uh, plans into action and we can see them develop. Uh, these are the few points that I would like to share to this August gathering. Thank you. Chair. Thank you. So we just heard two things. And of course, the experience of UMA is 
you know, when you have too many districts, too many villages in one particular regional development authority, uh, management becomes extremely difficult. To bring everyone on board becomes very, very difficult. Whereas Chennai has gone ahead. They've gone beyond the CMDA. They're now talking in terms of 8,000 square kilometers of area. But hopefully only for planning purposes, not for actually administrating purposes. In many cases, when they declared an area to be in the development authority area, and the areas were 7,000 square kilometers, 8,000 square kilometers, at that point of time, it was envisaged that land is very easily available. That may be a case about 20 years ago, but not anymore. Uh, I do not know to what extent it has actually benefited the area growth. It might have benefited some, like one of the MPs in the morning said, uh, some investors in land, some promoters and developers who can always say that, OK, this is the area for the trunk line, this is the area for metro line, this is the area for hospital. And that area is about 40 kilometers away or 50 kilometers away, or maybe in a different districts. But say that, OK, this is a part of MMRDA, away 80 kilometers, only 80 kilometers from this place. But this is a declared urban area, and sell those plots. Other than that, what benefited has happened or do not, has not happened, I am not in a position to say. But clearly, there is a requirement. There, is, there has to be some application of mine. So I think this is the right time when I can request Mr. Sista Vishwanath, who had been a former director of planning and HMDA, to intervene and guide us. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, at the start of the session, you had said, uh, uh, single planners, what are the experiences and how they grapple with the uh, this problem of platform governance. So I'll try to tell a little about the experience of Andhra Pradesh in general and Hyderabad in particular in this regard. Uh, the Andhra Pradesh government enacted the MPC Act that is Metropolitan Planning Committee Act of 2007, uh, which was a very quick and perfunctory exercise uh, just to meet the JNRM requirements and, uh, and other urban sector reform. But parallel along with this, the HMDA Act was also enacted, which was the outcome of serious concern of the state government to tackle the metropolitan issues of Hyderabad and surroundings. Uh, this act is a little different. It's a brand new act, 2008. It's a little different because it is through planning, coordination, and development promotion. What was left unsaid in the MPC Act was covered up in the HMDA Act of 2008. And in this, the HMDA is envisaged as an apex body for planning, coordination, and execution of development projects in the metropolitan region. A uh, large area of 7,100 square kilometers was declared as the metropolitan region, covering five districts, one municipal corporation, and two municipalities, and two notified area committees. Uh, it, it is a two-level body, that is the HMDA, it's a two-level body, with CM as the chairman, and roughly about 50% public representatives and remaining 50% ex officials, serving officials in the government of all key sectors of development as members. At the operational level, there is an executive committee, there's a second tier, consisting of officials of all the key departments and experts in the field of planning, projects, finance, and land management. Then the conflict between what Uma and uh, Usha was mentioning, and of course, Suresh also articulated, is that the conflict between the ULBs and the panchayats exercising control, the so-called development control over development, to a large extent has been resolved in this by saying uh, there's a clear-cut division of functions in the HMD Act. Uh, this is a little bit following the MMRDA Mumbai model. And the MM, uh, HMDA, as Apex body, has the powers of promoting and executing all land development. That it looks out only of the land development, not the building permissions, and the building enforcement or the monitoring mechanism. Uh, then it has the powers of promoting and executing all 
land development through land bank, through land pooling schemes, through development schemes, and of course, through the regulation of private uh, land development. Now, this is all very well, but the funding has been the bane of urban development in our country. The HMDA created the Hyderabad Metropolitan Development Fund with seed capital and metropolitan development and revolving fund as from the state government. This is again modeled on Delhi as well as the Mumbai model. This metropolitan development fund is basically to meet the money required for execution of infrastructure and amenities development by the various ULBs, local bodies, and the functional agencies like parastatus stated by Suresh, Metro Auto Works, the AP Transco, AP SRTC, AP IAC, et cetera. As far as planning is concerned, there has been a paradigm shift in the planning process which has been brought out in the act. Instead of the master plan, it specifies a metropolitan strategy plan. And together with a metropolitan investment plan, covering all sectors of development, from watershed management and environmental conservation to housing, infrastructure, amenities creation, transportation, including mass transit, industrial and commerce development, et cetera, with emphasis on preparation of action plans and area level plans. Again, emphasis is given, as Usha has also articulated, emphasis is given in projectization of the plans and implementation of the plans through capital investment, budgeting and programming, which ought to have been there in the MPC, but then the MPC Act was nothing but a carbon copy of the Constant Amendment, uh, just a four-page uh, enactment which does not spell out what are the actual functions the MPC is required to do. And all other development acts, all the UDA acts also don't articulate the implementation mechanism and the plan program and budgeting mechanism of the plans. You have a plan, you have a nice, good plan as Usha has said, but then how do you implement that? So this act makes it responsible on the part of the HMDA and other key functional departments to carry out through a metropolitan investment plan with a definite time period and plan programming. And uh, as Suresh has said, there's a separate chapter of Unified Metropolitan Transport Authority. That means the act recognizes that transportation is one of the key infrastructure requirements in the region. Which This is with the chief secretary as the chairman and all key functional departments as members. Now all this is above uh, whatever is uh, uh, stated in the HMDA Act is technically and administratively fine. But the question of us yesterday and today in the morning is that is it able to achieve the objectives of metropolitan governance emphasized in this CIPR study? Uh, to put it this way, Maybe I'm taking a very crude example, but then uh, uh, could articulate better. In respect of Andhra Pradesh, we have a driver and or pilot in the form of MPC, but whose vehicle is missing? And then we have a vehicle in the form of HMD Act who has no driver or is at, at best in autopilot. Hence, one of the suggestions, as Uma and Usha also said, is to give the driver this fine Audi vehicle, and of course, with adequate petrol, in the shape of metropolitan finance. Thus, both the legislations of MPC Act, which is only on paper, and the HMT Act, which is too, too new, out from the press, you can say, both these relations can be combined into one comprehensive law for ensuring effective metropolitan governance. Uh, 
we have the honor of having secretary as a chairman in this session. So one of the key issues as a planner, which we off, often encounter, is dedicated funding, especially funding for infrastructure development of our cities. The Rakesh Mohan Committee report talked about the cost of infrastructure needed for the country, which ran into lakhs of crores. The Hyderabad Master Plan says we require one lakh crores of rupees just for this metropolitan development plan implementation. How do we get that? Here is the area where the center has to step in. I remember in 1994, there was a project called Mega City Project, in which four mega cities of Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, and Chennai were added, were there, and two were added later on as an afterthought, that is Bangalore and Hyderabad. So we had six, that is five million plus cities. And we went in a very, started in a very small way, but it was quite successful and made a very visible change in these metropolitan areas. So similarly, such, could, such type of funding could be envisaged for our metropolitan areas in a graded manner. Uh, and I think this should be addressed to the planning commission to allocate funds, especially for metro cities, directly based on a well-defined criteria like the Gardil common formula for state allocation with minimum strings. I think that will make a sea of difference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bhai. Thank you, Mr. Viswanath. Uh, you know, uh, no government, whether it is central government or the state government, can actually uh, undertake to fund the entire requirement of infrastructure funding. And those six mission cities, the six mega cities have now become 35 mission cities. And some money is available, but the understanding was also that, that the mega cities or the mission cities will also have the capacity to raise the funds. Like today, we heard someone that well, almost 6% of the GDP or 6% of the, uh, they've been able to raise through taxation. So that was also envisaged. But the more important point that you raised is how do you give this vehicle one a driver and some petrol, <laughs> if it is possible. So if Professor Sridharan has some <laughs> ideas about providing a driver and a petrol to the council, <laughs> I would like to hear from you. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. I'll start with this. Uh, very difficult job which has been assigned by you as well as uh, naturally being a professor, I have another job which uh, Mr. Nasser initially mentioned the objective. I take the, both the you, Zuma and Usha, the problems and then convert them into some kind of objective for the future. So now you have added one more burden to me, so let me try. We have heard this, uh, what has happened in the case of Brazil in terms of political institutional contestation. Let me tell that it's not new to us. Then we also heard about Phil's statement on South Africa. The in, uh, again, institutional contestation. Now, one more dimension is in terms of China and also Korea, South Korea, which uh, Mike Douglas has mentioned, because most of our land loss comes from there. Their land adjustment, their everything comes from there, and then we try to incorporate it here. Now, given this various amalgamation of laws and acts and what. Now, we are trying to fix a solution. We are trying to fix an institution for a dynamic problem. Metropolitan thing, region, is a dynamic region. And we are trying to case it, frame it, and then put it in a particular institution, which is very, very difficult. Okay, we are trying to put a spatial, social, economic, everything, and then try to frame it and then picturize it so that we can see it forever, which is totally wrong from my perspective. The reason being, we have seen the case of Delhi. We tried to plan only Delhi, then we went to uh, that what you call Delhi Union Territory, then state, then NCR. Now the NCR itself is uh, spreading its wings to further and further and further. So where is the end to this? Are we going to create the India as one metro region? Okay, so that's a big question which we need to address, how we are going to do about it. In fact, I just told uh, KCS sir before lunch, I think most of us will be sleeping after lunch, so I had to deliberately provocate you so that we can have some kind of debate on this issue. 
The second point, which is being raised by the earlier planner speakers, yes, we have act on all these. We also have an act on community participation. There's the current STMA Act, or MPC Act, or MMRD Act, or anything. Does it include this community participation and also the latest one on community funding, financing? Then the responsibility is shifted, then it becomes a PPP, what the last P which Mr. Suresh has passed, uh, uh, talked about. Okay, so how far this is possible? In fact, the minister talked about that even the mixed land use. We started off with that. We have experimented everything in the world here. In fact, if you see the hottest market in Delhi, the corn market, it started off with the mixed use plan. Then finally now ended up with only the commercial. So where exactly we are going? Now, yesterday's discussion, today's discussion, we talked about participation, everything. We are not really talked about the referendum system in Switzerland. Even for a small thing, they talk about this referendum, even they can stop the country level issue through this referendum. If 1,000 signatures are there or 10,000 signatures are there, they can stop that whole thing. Do we have that kind of thing even under the RTI? Okay, we don't know. Okay, so we are trying to find out the new scalar arrangements, which are again static in nature. Okay, uh, I think uh, it has been pointed out by the person from Jakarta. We require the horizontal as well as vertical arrangements. And even in that, we need a dynamic solution. And also talk about the knowledge construction, which are which take into account the invisible spaces. It's not only the creative space or the credible space which Mr. Munzi has talked about, because again, I bring in another issue. Now the SEZ as a township, as a separate unit has come up. How we are integrating within the MMRD area or say uh, CMD area or a Hyderabad area? Because they want a separate status in terms of function, in terms of management and, and thing, and then throw out all the solid base outside. Now, that is one issue. The second part which I want to talk about is the database which Uma has talked about. And again, we experimented. Delhi came out with the first act of spatial data infrastructure, okay, which I love it, because theoretically it has got everything. You can see a 3D building in a street in a particular place, and then plan. Suppose if it is turned its side, suppose one person constructs like this, what is going to be happen? Now that tool is again a toy. Beyond that, it has not been used in the day-to-day -day practice because of coordination problems, okay? Suppose every city has that SDIS tool, spatial data infrastructure tool, we can do wonders. Not only about 30 years, I can even predict 100 years from now, simulating the sea level rise, simulating the disaster, everything. But are we using those tools? That's a big question mark, okay? And th that's a problem of coordination, rather than creating uh, one more monster and then putting it in between the different in the scalar arrangement, the local level or the middle level or whatever level you talk about. So I think it is uh, more in terms of how to give teeth to that existing institutions like especially Metropolitan Planning Committee. And we also, even for the finance, I don't agree with some of my earlier speakers. Now we have to add on to what is SFC has said, how many, except Kerala, where I've been involved with uh, our students in district planning committees where they cover both the urban and rural and then come out in the district, urban strategy, rural strategy, everything, and through participatory means. Finally, end up with the sectoral plans, okay? So there, there is a system where the politicians participate, administrator participates, everything. We have experimented. It's almost like Brazilian planning system. So we have all the things with us, but how to use it and put it into proper practice is a big question, okay? And SFC gives us enough strength probably as uh, Mr. Pandey suggested, putting GST and putting some more professional tax into the kitty, I think we can do wonders within the existing instrument, how to use it, and what kind of scalar arrangement we are going to have. That will be the my this thing. And use of this SDI for that old purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sridharan. Uh, can I now request Mr. Ravindra, who is the urban advisor to the Chief Minister of Karnataka, Karnataka experience, of course, is very, very relevant. Thank you, and uh, when the last speaker, I hope all of you are sufficiently awake. Uh, when the subject relates to governance of megacity regions, 
then there are two broad issues as I see. One relates to the intergovernmental relations and the other to the actual governance of the metropolitan region. These two are need to be distinguished. Let me begin where I think the question posed by Mr. Nasser Munji to begin with, objectives and institutions. Before creating an institution, you certainly set certain objectives. So let me take the example of Bangalore. In Bangalore in the 19, mid 80s, when you know, Bangalore's growth was quite rapid, you know, in 70s, 70s and 80s, it registered the maximum growth in India for any metropolitan city. So government thought that, you know, we had already created a number of institutions, parastatals, you know, apart from the municipal corporation, we created an agency for water supply, <coughs> for electricity, for transport, and so on and so forth. And therefore, there is a need to create uh, one agency, an umbrella agency, which would be able to plan and coordinate, not merely for the city, but for the entire metropolitan region, for the larger area. So we created what is called a Bangalore Metropolitan Region. It is 8,000 square kilometers, which covered the Bangalore district, entire district region territorially. And this Metropolitan Region Development Authority was supposed to really you know, plan for the entire region, prepare a structure plan, and also coordinate the activities of the multiple institutions that were existing. So now, what has been the experience? we find that the objectives for which this institution was set up have not really been achieved. You know, they did try to prepare what is called a structure plan with a lot of consultants and all that. And that is still not in place, not being implemented in the strict sense of the term. We are again trying to revise the structure plan. Secondly, coordination. Coordination has utterly failed. They have not performed that coordinating role at all. So one can go into the question of why has this happened? Now, for instance, you know, the, one of the weaknesses I found was that the DMRDA is chaired by the chief minister himself, and the heads of all institutions are members. But the real difficulty was to convene the meetings because we had to get the time from the chief minister. So we hardly meetings are held of this DMRDA. But there is another reason which is special to Bangalore because we also have what is called a Bangalore Development Authority, you know, which is again with similar objectives. <laughs> they are the planning authority for the city, not for the region. And again, they are supposed to coordinate the functions. There, what happened was because the DDA, as they say, that you know, it was also a development agency. So the entire focus was on land development, you know, allotment of sites. So that became the premier agency in which even the chief minister was more interested. So planning suffered in both places, in a sense. So we must be very clear about not only creating a structure, but what, could, what would be the real the mechanism for implementation. I think that is extremely important. So when we again talk about you know, the MPC, the Metropolitan Planning Committee now, which is mandated by the Constitution, in the first place, I find that none of the states is really interested in setting up an MPC. And they have, some of them have set up more to fall in line with the mandate of the Constitution, primarily, and per perhaps more importantly to ensure that the central funds flow. Otherwise, Mr. Mishra will, cut off, will say you have not you know, you know, implemented the reforms which we have laid down, and therefore I will not release the next installment. And therefore, many of them have, you know, Calcutta, of course, had set up earlier, now Mumbai and Chennai. And, See, Bank Chennai has not set up, I think, isn't it? And nor has Bangalore. So in fact, as urban advisor, uh, I'll mention the experience of two initiatives that I had taken up. One is, see, see, Bangalore is one large city which doesn't have a separate act of its own. So the Karnataka Municipal Corporation Act applies to not only to Bangalore, which is the largest city in the state, which is almost nearing 10 million, it's becoming mega city. And the next largest city is not even a million. So a number of other cities are combined in that act. So we thought, considering the special problems of Bangalore, Bangalore should have special separate legislation. And we'll also try to look at all these metropolitan issues and the local government issues, et cetera. So we prepared what is called a Bangalore Metropolitan Governance Bill. Governance Bill. 
So it's, it's the first time perhaps in India that an act, if at all it is passed, shall be called governance. It's not merely a corporations act or some other. So we wanted to focus on governance. So it, it covered the entire metropolitan region. So it has been divided into three parts. One is the local government as I dealt with dealing with the municipalities. That means the municipal corporation provisions would come in there. It will be the first part. And we suggested a host of reforms. So now I think the earlier, uh, the MP from Karnataka, Chandra Gowda was mentioning how the mayor gets changed every year. And before, you know, before even the first mayor settles down, uh, you know, he has to, the, the government starts thinking as to who should be the next mayor. So we thought the, the mayor should have a longer term, maybe four years or five years. Therefore, we proposed either a directly elected mayoral system for a period of five years, or at least have a mayor in council as in Calcutta. But at the same time, have a mayoral committee or a council, like somewhat like the cabinet system at the state level. The mayor is like the chief minister, and the other 10, 12 members will handle different portfolios. And you know, certain other reforms, which are equally important about decentralization. Now, the ward committees, for instance, I think we have been talking about. See, the ward committees, again, they are required to be set up by the by the constitution, but very few cities have done, or done it only for namesake. So here we gave proper shape to the functions of the ward committees, and also neighborhood committees are areas of us. Government has also passed a separate law, a law called community participation law. But very recently, you know, they, but they were not being set up at all for years. So recently, a PIL has filed in the Karnataka High Court. Some of the activists went and said, you know, we have passed the act, it is required by the constitution, but board committee has not been set up. So just last month, the High Court directed that you shall set up the board committees within a period of three weeks. So because it is a High Court order, and if you don't do it, you will get into contempt. Government suddenly, you know, all, all of them got together and they wanted to constitute the committees. But even then the corporators said, why do you want board committees? So it is the, the, the reluctance to part with power is not confined to those in Delhi or in Mumbai or Bangalore. Even to those, you know, at the local level, the corporator feels I cannot part with my powers to the so-called people or citizens, you know, the ward committee or areas above, or still, directly citizens have to part with. No, we are talking about participatory <coughs> governance. But in practice, how practical is participatory governance? And just because a few NGOs may be good. I mean, morning we found uh, the person from uh, <coughs> you know, Jakarta speaking very passionately about it. It's certainly very good. We want that to happen. But in practice, we find the, the, the problems and the, and the hindrances you know, come more from the political class. It's not from the people themselves. I mean, they speak in the name of the people. We are trying to prevent giving power to the people, empowering the people. Empowerment is a very big expression these days. But in the heart of hearts, those who are in power at the higher level do not want to empower those at the lower level. So, I mean, that is the key to be understood. So how do we now look at looking at the future? What do we do? But we need some structure, and we need to go by the Constitution. And ours is a democracy. And therefore, we cannot think of purely a democratic body. I mean, that is where. For instance, the conflict between democracy and efficiency does come up. So democracy, we feel, I mean, democratic elected bodies, the councillors, the officials, they are full of corruption. Things don't happen. You know, you have to move from pillar to post. And therefore, even the government, you know, gives set of special purpose vehicles. It may be a water supply board or a metro, whatever it is. And they may be delivering services with greater efficiency. But MPC is again a body you know, where two thirds are supposed to be elected representatives from the, and the other one third are nominated. I don't think we can really go away from the democratic, uh, a democratic body. That, that, that is required also because ultimately you need political decisions. Decis only when the state government has to come decide something, something will happen. So, so uh, that is that is one uh, I, you know, initiative which we find in Bangalore. We are still struggling. The second one is that you know we also try to prepare an urban development policy for the state as a whole. This is where I would lay emphasis on policy. See, we are talking about so many things, but unless those things fall in the context of an urban policy, urban development policy, whatever it is, 
you know, things won't happen or they happen in an ad hoc fashion. So we created a policy framework for the whole state. And there, wherein we emphasize that it's just, just don't look at Bangalore as a dominant city. It is like, you know, England means, you know, think of London. As somebody said England is London and the rest. So every, <laughs> all other cities and regions, you look at it different. Similarly, you know, whether it is West Bengal, Calcutta, and there we don't even know the names of cities in West Bengal except Calcutta. Many of those were outside. So Bangalore and, and the rest. So there are other cities like Hubli Dharwad, Mysore, and a number of other. We have 200 now towns and cities. So we need to develop the secondary cities. When we talk about metropolitan regions, let us not forget, these are only a few in number. But there are hundreds and thousands of other cities and towns where we also need to develop them. Otherwise, you know, cities will still continue to get congested. So ultimately, I think that is the most important. So what should be the objective of the metropolitan? I'll finish in two minutes metropolitan region when you want to create. In the first place, what is it that you want to achieve in that region? Chennai now wants to have, whether it's 4,000, 8,000, why? Why do you want 4,000? Why do you want 8,000? Bangalore, Bangalore already. <laughs> no, he's a, that is the reason. I mean, <laughs> Hyderabad said after Bangalore, it's Hyderabad also. Now, do you want, do you feel that your capital city has got congested? You want to develop the other regions? Like in Bangalore, that is the idea. No, we, okay, we set up smaller townships and then connect them. So, but then again, you are creating mega, mega cities, and what about the quality of life? You know, you are speaking about tra transportation, traffic, connectivity, and uh, now somebody in the morning spoke about the quality of life, ultimately urban quality of life. And if you look at the ratings of the quality of life of cities across the world, which is brought out every year global, globally, it is none of the mega cities are there in the, far, in the top 10, at least even the top 20. It is all medium-sized uh, cities like you know, Zurich and Geneva and uh, Vancouver and Vienna and things like that. And even London, they are all come, they come down the low. I mean, the quality of life does suffer if it is too large. So maybe in the metropolitan region, you have one core city already created. Think of other smaller townships where you may be able to create better quality of life. And as I said, uh, uh, the last point is about of urban capacity building as a sediment. We also need to develop the capacity to manage the cities politically, because political leadership, at the same time, administrative leadership, and we, reforms can happen only you know, if these, all these are uh, married together. Thank you. The only point that I want to add is, you know, the planning commission had constituted some subgroups before they finalized the 12th plan document. One of the subgroups related to strategic planning. And the subgroup's recommendation was, by and large, that while the concept of a metropolitan council is very good, if you take up a very large area, in the last 30 years experience, and all the speakers have also said that this is a vehicle without a driver or without a petrol, and it's very difficult to do. It's better that we confine ourselves to the core areas and also take up small towns with small in the sense in Indian context, towns with two to three lakhs, which is already an urban area with a peri-urban ring, which is already there, and prepare a special plan for them. And then somehow they will all find a way to link each other. So that was a clear recommendation of the strategy group. And uh, this, this seems to be also, also coming out from this, that while a metropolitan council can at best expect you to give some kind of a strategic plan, some kind of a spatial plan, to expect it to be able to actually administer that particular area, govern that particular area, at this point of time might be a little difficult. So we have, we'll take, spend about 10 to 15 minutes time and you can take a few questions. Okay, you were the first to raise your hand, please.
actually looking uh, to actually enforce and why this thrust on home ownership. Uh, the second uh, question is more to Nasir and uh, Mr. Suresh. Uh, if you do understand and if you do agree with at least our thesis that incremental housing and self-built housing uh, is has the potential to be the most scalable solution as both consumers and producers of house, uh, ho housing stock are the same people, what do we do about the built form? As Nasser, you seem to be the only one who was worried about the built form from an aesthetic point of view. What can we do about the built form and from a safety point of view? And uh, here I'm talking both at the regional level where we see urbanization is happening more on the seismic belts of India. So this is not even geographical. It's happening uh, multi-geography. And what do we do about the built form and who, who will be responsible for understanding the, the construction standard and the disaster implications of these sprawling uh, urban towns and smaller cities? So whose responsibility is that? Thank you. Should I take the questions first and then, yeah. What I will do is we'll take about three questions and try to answer them. Then you go to the next three. <coughs> Let me take off from the point about the, the vehicle having a driver and fuel. Uh, it also has an engine. Um, and it's n the engine, I think, has been missing in all of our discussions. That is the staffing of these uh, particular institutions that you're talking about. And in particular, it seems to me that the question becomes that if you are talking about a new institution, are you then talking about a new set of staff? Are you borrowing staff from below or from above? If you're borrowing it from below or above, who retains the final oversight over those particular people and the staff? It seems to me that any kind of active institution of this kind, the particularly political leadership has to retain a certain amount of uh, responsibility and uh, effectiveness in dealing with staff, setting standards of, uh, to begin with for hiring and for performance and so forth. Otherwise, uh, it won't work. Uh, yeah, my question pertains to the functioning of the MMRDA, actually. Uh, firstly, is there an attempt in the MMRDA to resolve a kind of conflict of interest that it faces both as a planner and as a developer or a player in the land market since you know it is a uh, it developed it has developed the bandra kurla complex and other areas in, in the city also secondly are there steps that mmrd is taking to internalize the externalities that arise from its activities again uh, the example of bkc and the impact that developing that region has had on uh, the kind of transport networks from bandra and kurla so internalizing those kinds of externalities through better coordination with other urban local bodies or other agencies. Thank you. So we'll answer the three questions first, then we'll come to you. To answer your question, when we, when we said about five times, basically it is the entitlement. Uh, now we've redefined the categories called the EWS and LIG. An economically weaker section will be considered to be that particular individual whose annual income is less than one lakh rupees. And an LIG will now be that individual whose annual income is less than two lakh rupees. So previously it used to be 60,000 rupees and one lakh 20,000. So with an annual income of one lakh rupees, an EWS category person is, will be considered to be almost about four to five lakh rupees. None of the banks give you more than three times anyway. But what you're saying is, even if you're able to get about four to five lakh rupees of institutional credit support, then we're not talking of places like Bombay and Delhi, but in other parts of the country, you might be in a position to build a small hutment of about 25 square meter. If it goes up to an LIG category and he gets up to eight to 10 lakh rupees, then with eight to 10 lakh rupees, you shall be in a position to build a small decent two bedroom apartment. I'm not again talking of Delhi and Bombay. Let's not <coughs> keep Delhi and Bombay in our minds. I'm talking of the whole country. To that extent, these parameters will support. That is that is the reason why we have done it. In a place like Delhi and in a place like Bombay, of course, the solutions will have to be different because here the land cost and the building costs are very, very different. Coming to the design and what are the specifications? Uh, now you know that the whole country, we have already had <coughs> seismic zones which clearly demarcated. We've also come out with building plan requirement of all these zones. There are lots of planets here you can step in. We further want to drill it down. We really want to go down to the district level. 
and even on a district level to identify areas which are sensitive seismically. So that is one thing. The second thing is develop control rules, the DCR norms, which basically deal with aesthetics. That is also an issue which is engaging the attention of not only the national planners, but also the state and regional planners. So this is to answer your question. Would you like to add anything on this before you go to MMRDA? Um, yeah, just briefly. Um, I'm all in favor of incremental housing. I think uh, there, there is a real potential there. But at the same time, I feel that the supply side has not responded sufficiently to affordability issues. Because there are other forms of, of, um, uh, of developing housing, um, which is very fast, very quick, and provides the quality that's necessary, including seismic, uh, uh, seismic issues. And I'm involved with an NGO that's actually working on that. Um, so a deliverable form is possible, uh, but it needs to be done to some scale. I'm looking at whether HUTCO would look at some, some of these issues, because this is exactly what we need to do. Because what India needs is speed and scale, uh, rather than you know, these small interventions. How do you actually do that? Um, and the built form I'm very worried about. Uh, uh, when I say aesthetics, it can actually be uh, cheaper than what people are doing today. Uh, you know, the concrete house, two windows, terrace, st staircase going on the side. You could really do something wonderful with that. But we seem to have lost that texture in the last 30, 40 years. And even in Rajasthan, I've been in a village where a, where a community has moved from its old village, which is so beautiful, to something really hideous which is the modern, um, you know, box. Um, but I, I'm a little worried about that, you know, is that how, even, now for example, incrementally fixing the old village would have been far better than actually moving to, 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 the, new to the new housing. Uh, very briefly adding on. Uh, Self-built housing means all single storied building. That means your use, utilization of the land has got to be each household building his own house with the best possible uh, space, specification, and services, the way they can do. It gives a lot of flexibility for them. Satisfaction level will be very high. Complaints will be less. But there will be substantial delay because all won't work together. But what is really required is that with the type of urbanization and the speed at which the housing is to be done, you can have a combination. I don't put either this or that. You can have a combination of both those together. For example, if you want a little more larger dense density to be achieved, where more number of people are to be accommodated in the same area, what we should do is we can work not only in horizontal incremental housing, but also vertical incremental housing. I have any number of good examples, which is done with the Hutco's design and development wing, with two-story uh, um, incremental housing, where the Bhopal gas tragedy housing, around 12 houses on the ground floor, eight houses on the first floor, horizontal ground floor, Ground floor people will grow horizontally, and as far as the first floor people are concerned, in the space that is left out of the four unit, they start doing the housing. So initially, within that cost level, which was told by the chairman, we will do that, and later on they can add on as and when the capacity. If you go to Chennai, Chitranagar, Tamil Nadu slum clearance board housing, three to four story slum housing, each of the category of people, they are not like dabbas, which are going with one plan going like that, but beautiful planning has gone in there, architects and planners have worked on it, each one can have the incremental housing that is, that means even in a single storied, double storied, triple and four storied development, as against conventional multi storied blocks being there, with good planning, you can have incremental housing coming. So therefore, there is hope for that particular thing. But whether all that should be self-built, quote unquote, that means self-built means you're thinking of you along with a local mason or a carpenter, you won't have a contractor there, obviously. But whereas, if you want to have the use land in a better way, do those particular initial components of the structural earthquake, cyclone, tsunami, all those related things, fire related issues, do those particular core related things, and maybe the additional component can always be done by supplemented by uh, the families. It can be a combination of both those together. I mean, that's a short answer. I'll open it up later during the tea break. Sir, there's a question on MMRDA's role as a planner and developer. Conflicting is concerned. I would say that within the organization, we try to see that they converge and they do not conflict. But the second set of roles that have a possibility of uh, 
uh, conflicting is again the role of regulator and role of the developer, not only planner but also regulator. Uh, so we try our best to see that these are not come, uh, they do not come in conflict. But I think there is a larger role for uh, observers from outside, citizens and observers also to watch out and uh, just point out at an appropriate time if uh, it is perceived that they are in conflict. Uh, secondly, about uh, uh, the externalities uh, arising out of developments like Bandakulla complex by a government agency like MMRDA, of course there are consequences. The conse consequences are twofold. One is because it's an international finance and business center and primarily a commercial area, there is a lot of impact on uh, traffic. Uh, so it's our effort to see that there are four entries and exit points coming into and going out of Bandakulla complex to uh, uh, smoothen the flow into the rest of the city. Uh, the second consequence that might arise out of this is the land use readjustment in the area surrounding the Bandrakurla complex. Because the complex has acquired such a status today in terms of uh, commercial status as well as the um, land value status, the areas surrounding it such as Dharavi and Sayan and some other areas, Mahim, uh, also tend to have the spillover effects of uh, uh, this impact. And uh, I think in the longer run, it, it's useful for the city to readjust itself uh, with this uh, kind of land use readjustment rather than suffering from we it. We have five minutes more, so you can take one or two questions. questions. One and two and three, that's it. But be very short because they have a new session and I have to fly to catch. Uh, um, what would be the role of what could be the role of the, uh, the town and plan country planning legislation vis-a-vis -vis the regional uh, metropolitan development leg legislation on one hand and the MPCs on the other. So in what ways could they conflict? In what ways can we build better synergies? Obviously, there can't be any conflict. It has to be coterminous with each other. If we, whenever there is a regional planning, it ha has to be, there is a state level town and country planning body. It has to conform to that. Sir, I'm a lawyer, sir. Yeah. So you are a lawyer. Um, that's the question. <laughs> what uh, Dr. Kavindra ji said that they have one urban policy in Karnataka. Similarly, we have national urban housing and habitat policy. We have national uh, san urban sanitation policy. Yes. Uh, do you think, sir, there is a time now to think that we should have a national urban policy as well, which, which includes all this, whatever policies exist in center? saying these are yet to be approved by the approved. government. Okay. But you know, this is a point I raised uh, before you take on. You know, some years, a couple of years back when the Deputy Chairman Planning Commission, Mr. Montek Singh had come and there was a sort of discussion on these urban issues here and here. I said, why not we have a national urban policy or a urban, urban policy, I mean, urban, 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 they're slightly different, but then urban. at least, you know, put certain strategic sort of, a, <coughs> you know, evolve, evolve a plan, or like this, you know, about metropolitan regions and, you know, and the type of local governments and infrastructure development. They, it has to be very broad. It cannot be because urban development is a state subject. And it can, uh, and so states can formulate their own uh, policies, but at this national level, maybe a sort of things, anyway, national government keeps issuing guidelines on so many things. This could also be treated as a game, some, some sort of a policy. I think partly answered in the 12th plan document. And obviously, yesterday also you heard that urban development doesn't necessarily mean Ministry of Urban Development and Ministry of Housing. It can also mean education, health, commerce, transportation, everyone. So the 12th plan document has identified five or six broad subsector plans which should all converge and come out with an urban development plan. What is the CDP, the city development plan as urban development plan, should have this five to six components. So once the planning commission documents stipulate that these are the five, six activities, then individual ministries will work on that. Out of the six, two, two works will be uh, affordable housing for all, housing for all, or inclusive growth for the slum area areas. So these two will come in my ministry, transportation will go on into two other ministries, so it's, there is already an attempt, but yes, I agree with you. At some point of time, maybe we should come out with an integrated policy. Last question. Yeah, um, I just wanted to know. I mean, Mr. Mishra, this is for you. Um, 
does it make sense, considering the budgets that some of the city states now have, for them to interact directly with the planning commission? Because uh, some of the, uh, for instance, Bangalore, as you pointed out, has a requirement which is uh, way, way, way different from what the entire state of Mysore, Karnataka would need to, to Bombay. So how about that as a, a different level of engagement, considering that no state government would really uh, like to involve the, I mean, give a clear idea of what they want for the urban areas. Sorry, I couldn't get that you were too close to the planning commission. I mean, I'm saying, should it be the engaged directly with the planning commission? Or can the cities interact with the planning commission directly for funding? Yeah. As of now, I suppose the planning commission, if the state government of Karnataka allows it, I suppose they will do it. You know, the question is, it's, it's not that the planning commission will not like to do it. The planning commission will definitely like to do it. But that the planning commission is there basically to apportion the plan outlay between the center and the state, not between center and a particular city. If the states agree to that, they might like to do it. But I suppose as of now, I don't see that situation coming up. They can definitely interact with individual cities. They do interact with individual cities. The central government ministry do interact with individual cities. But the form is that you recognize that the state has to be there as an active player in that. So let me take this opportunity to thank all the panel members for your contribution and suggestion. I know at the end of the day we have confused the matter more, but uh, it's a difficult area, so I don't think we can really expect an answer to come up immediately. One point is very well taken, it's a dynamic situation. The other point is there is a need for a strategic planning at a regional level, even if there is no need for actual devolution of powers and funds and finances to the particular level, there is a dire and crying need for a planning and this constitutional body which has been created the Metropolitan Planning Council should have been, should be given some kind of an additional responsibility.